Powered studio monitors, the good, the bad, the ugly. That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delisello with Audio Hawks. We got James Larson in the house. We're going to be talking about studio monitors, the good ones and the bad ones. How you doing, James? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So, you know, James came up with this cool idea. He measured a bunch of powered studio monitors and he listened to them. And he said, Gene, we should do a little face off and show you what is responsible for making a good studio monitor and what is not so good. So we got, I think, two or three examples here that we're going to go over. And then we're going to compare it to a reference speaker, a passive reference speaker that has really good neutral measurements. Just to show you guys, you know, what are the studios using when they're recording uh, music? Are they using good speakers or are they using speakers that may not be as neutral as you think? And can that be responsible for bad recordings? But that's a topic for another video that we could explore. But right now, I just want to focus on the measurements and what James heard between these different studio monitors. So James, I'm going to share the PowerPoint here and just have you kind of go through the speakers that we're looking at. What are the four speakers on this slide? Okay, well, these speakers, there's the, um, in the upper left-hand corner, that's the um, PreSonus Aris E8 XTs. And on the upper right-hand corner, it's the uh, Behringer Next K8s. On the lower left-hand corner, the Kali LP8s version one. In the lower right hand corner is the um mono price sv 28 but now I, we have we have reviews of some of these the calis i think we have in the presonos right yeah we've reviewed the calis and the personas we never reviewed the others um uh yeah so yeah i mean the, but the the point of the slideshow isn't to pick on any uh, like particular speaker or it's more like um we want to make the, uh, the point that monitors aren't all the same and they can vary in quality greatly. And so if you want a good, like, you know, if, if you want to be sure you're making good content, you need good monitors because a bad con monitor is going to throw your content way off or the sound that you expect it to hear on the user's end. And so yeah, like, you want some, you want something to be neutral, not to accentuate any particular frequencies or have any bad resonances, which can color the sound basically. Yeah, so like this whole, it's all came about because of a, a monitor that I, uh, the basically the Behringer is I recently measured, I bought like a couple a year ago and I measured them kind of recently and like, wow, there's some problems here. And so that's what prompted this whole kind of exercise. So to go over these points, um, so home, home audio speakers don't need to be accurate. Accuracy doesn't hurt. I mean, I think accuracy sounds good, but there's other ways a speaker can sound good outside of being super accurate. Like you can have certain tonal balances or tonal shifts, right? Sure. That can still sound good, although not be completely accurate. But monitors, studio monitors, speakers made for, um, pr I mean, reproducing content that you're creating, they have to reflect what's, what goes in has to be what comes out, right? And so if you don't have that, it's, it's, you know, you don't know what's going to, you know, how is that going to sound on any other user's uh, system? Probably it's going to sound very good. So if you're producing content on an inaccurate sound system, um, the flaws on that you make on that sound system, it's going to, that could be, um, it'll be reflected. The, the problem, the problems in the, in the system you're making on, they'll be reflected on any other good system. So bad mixes sound good on good systems. And I mean, no, no bad mixes sound bad on good systems but they could sound worse on even on like mediocre systems. So like mm -hmm. you need to make sure that, you know, your sound system that you're mixing on, that you're mastering on, it's a good system or else you, anything could be going on with your mix and you wouldn't hear it. You wouldn't know about it. Yeah, I got you. So here's the speakers that we're looking at here as, as well as the various price points. Yeah. So yeah. like, like, I mean, this is just, like I said, this is kind of a general like essay on, good versus bad monitors. These monitors are actually the only ones still in production here. These all discontinued, mostly pretty recently discontinued. The only one that's still on sale is the Behringer Next K8s. But PreSonus Pre recently discontinued the Aris E8 XTs in favor of the a new version of that. I think it's a largely the same. Kali Audio, they have the LPA-8 V2 now. It's mostly the same, but they made some improvements. And the mm -hmm. Monoprice SV28 is, you know, it's not on the market anymore. So like, the relevance of these isn't it's not particularly relevant as a comparison or shootout since you can't even can't really buy these anymore except for the Behringers. It's more like just 
just to show you how trend basically yeah how much monitors can vary in um accuracy and like well just how good they are so here, here's the uh, the iris e8 xts we reviewed these these are really good right very good speaker i actually i really like these. in fact of all the products i ever reviewed this is the only one i ever bought after the review I like i like these so much i just bought wow. them. yeah i wanted these because like i'm holding on to these I'm like so i the only only thing i ever reviewed that i bought afterward and, and they're really good and you can go to the next slide um yeah it's very very accurate not perfectly accurate but pretty accurate and uh you know there's a lot of good news here very good uh uh first reflections directivity index the um listening window is very flat the on access response is very flat there's a few little eccentricities here and there but overall what you put into these is what comes out of them right they're not going to color the sound that much and so and that's a great testament for a product that's relatively inexpensive to have good measurements like this that means they put some good engineering into it you know yeah this is a very well engineered product and i, I didn't just buy these just because they were accurate and sound great but because of the build quality they have also had to base management so you, you can high pass this response uh, like about at 80 or 100 hertz and they have some other cool features they're also relatively low noise all these monitors will have a kind of background hiss right that's this, true, especially if you're near field, you hear This it. is very mild. This one has a very mild, like any background noise. So like, it's just a really good monitor. Um, well, I'll put links up if you guys want to actually read the review for James Larson. Uh, it'll be in the cards so you guys can take a look at that. And so here's the in-room response. It's very nice, very flat, um, very neutral. Nice. between the two speakers. Yeah, and like there's a few eccentricities in the measurements that do crop up in, the measure, in, the, um, in this in-room measurement a little bit. The, I mean, the anechoic um there's there's things about the antiquate measurement that I do crop up in the on in room measurement but overall yeah, it's really it's pretty good um and like um it, it for the price it's very good so this is now this is at the main listening position where you measured or a meter away in room this is the main lane listening position this is like a like five point measurement that kind of uh, is around the, the main listening position so this is right. like basically what you what you're a five point average i say of each yeah speaker. yeah yeah so no, I, yeah. I mean, look how consistent. Look, when you get that kind of consistency between the left and right speaker, that just means you're going to have even better imaging when they are matched in amplitude response. So that is important. That, that's very good, especially considering the price of these speakers. It's very yep. good. Then the Kali LPH V1s, we reviewed these are also very good. Um, they are not terribly expensive. I, they've been replaced by the V2s, which significantly lowers the noise floor, or so I hear. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, it's like beautifully flat response. I mean, everything is really good with this. You know, there's a few, like, as with the um, Pusonuses, there's a few eccentricities, like that little dip at around 900 hertz. It's probably something to do with the port, right? A lot of mm -hmm. port resonances will have, like, kind of a, a null, uh, a cancellation around that area. So this probably has, it also has a little bump, like, at 15 hertz, kilohertz, right? It's not going to be audible. Is that because you measured the speaker close to the tweeter and it's maybe not fully, the waveform is not fully summed with the waveguide and it's giving a little extra high energy? Or is that, you think that it's just tuned a no. little bit? No, no, I think that's the tuning because if that was, if that was the case, you'd see that at, like, maybe one measurement position, but not all, but you can see that that's oh, yeah, happening in all that, measurement positions. Yeah, yeah So, true. like, um, like, in the listening window and in the uh, early reflections curve it's it's bumped up across everywhere so that's the way that that speaker is tuned well some people might prefer that for a little extra presence too i think i think so but i think also yeah it, it's it's fine Be there's not a lot of content at 15 kilohertz and just to be honest neither neither you or i could probably hear that i can't hear yeah there's no way i could hear above 15k anymore so. yeah that's not a really big deal okay go going on to the mono price these are discontinued um yeah, I, I, I had, they sent me a pair, I measured it. Um, they had their problems. They're, they aren't available, they haven't been available for a while now, but um, so you can go to the next slide. I mean, these are like, these are pretty cheap. Those are like 250 to $300. Still pretty darn good measurements. I mean, maybe it's a little bit more recessed in the high frequencies, but. <laughs> I think I this is a problem. I think this yeah. is a problem because like, you have this peak, a wide band peak at like around one kilometer, right? Yep. And that's going to be audible. And if you mix things with that kind yeah. of like response, right? Yep. Whatever you mix that's going to sound good on those speakers is going to have a flaw on, say, a, a neutral sound system, right? Or, or th that flaw could be accentuated on, uh, on a worse system, right? So, like, you, you could EQ that 
you can yeah. get it out, but like if you just use these speakers as is, um, the inverse of what you mix, if uh, like let's say you have a recording that sounds good on this, like it sounds neutral and natural on these speakers, well, played back on a on a neutral system, it'll have the inverse of this curve, the recording, so you'll have a res uh a, like a recessed sound at around like uh, like centered around one kilohertz, and it's a really broad recessed sound, so it won't sound it'll sound like there's something wrong with it, like on the recording that you make with these monitors, if you don't correct for that problem. And that's the way these sound out of the box. So yeah, so if you own these speakers, you need a low Q filter that basically cuts out or tames out that one kilohertz peak. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem. Two, three dB at least. Yeah. Yeah. So but these are really cheap speakers. And they do play pretty loud. But like, I would, I would, okay, I think they're probably okay for mixing our, our casual content on, but if you're like, mm -hmm. for like really like, you know, high grade commercial stuff, this is nowhere near good enough. Nowhere near good enough. Like, so, you know, you have to be careful what you're mixing. Here's the near fields. And and I include this graph, like, okay, th this, that the graph that we previously saw, saw was the speaker measured at one meter, which is considered far field, right? How all the drivers sum together and the port. How they all sound as a together. system, as a system, yeah, yeah, as a system. So the next slide um, shows you how each of the drivers perform individually by placing the mic right next to the drivers and recording that. So you can see there's a, a, a the blue trace is the port, the green trace is the woofer, and the red trace is the tweeter. But there there's a lot of the woofer getting the tweeter's measurement. So that, that yeah, because you couldn't separate the drivers individually and measure them. Yeah, yeah, so that so the tweeter's measurement is only relevant uh, above two kilohertz, below right. that. But everything else is, is full band and the, the, it's all good outside of that and so i don't i don't really understand why this speaker is peaking it has this like high q peak at around one kilohertz right it's not clear from these near field measurements what's doing that but something is and like i i measured this over and over again and that's it's it, it it's it's a audible problem but yeah. i'm just including this to, to just to say i don't know why this is doing this this is, this is a mystery to me Right, huh. I couldn't figure out. Usually, when I, I find a problem, I try to hunt it down and figure out what's causing it. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I don't know why it's doing that. Right, but anyways, if you go to the next, I think I believe the next slide is okay. Now, you know, this is uh, um, the vertical axis response. Okay, and now that might be strange. So, why did you include this? Right, this is not that, that relevant. But as a point of comparison to a speaker, we're going to look at a little bit later. Right. That's why I'm including this. But if you look at the vertical axis, okay, on the on axis of the tweeter at zero degrees, everything sums up fine. If you go a little mm -hmm. bit above that, below that, you start to get nulls. But on axis, things work pretty well, right? I think the next slide shows that uh, a little bit more. Yeah, so take take a draw a line like horizontally through uh, you know two points on this graph and um. Where there's like solid red is where you want to be listening because that's where all this uh, the drivers are integrating smoothly. Um, and that's at this speaker it happens at like zero degrees. There's like a dark you know, the line you draw through zero degrees horizontally would be just all dark red almost, right? And that's what will sound the fullest, it'll sound the best. Everything's in phase, right? So I'm I'm just so keep this in mind for a speaker we'll be looking at a little bit later. Okay. Okay. Everything's fine. And here's here's the horizontal response. Now yes, it has that one kilohertz problem a little bit here, but outside of that, it's actually the the um, the off axis responses are nicely correlate with the on axis response, right? Or, uh, the tonality of this thing is the same wherever you are on the on the horizontal axis. So you could be way over to the left or right, it's gonna sound the same. And that's, that's a good quality of the speaker. The only place where it kind of doesn't do this is around, I guess, six, 700 Hertz, you see some flaring. That's probably from the port, probably port resonances, like, um, causing phase shifts. Um, so if you go to the next axis, uh, next map, okay, this is that same graph, but I have the on-axis response zeroed out. So you can see how well the oh, okay. off-axis responses correlate to the on-axis response. Again, this this I don't normally include this slide, but this is gonna be this is gonna become relevant later on. So like outside of that, like I don't know, uh, port like weirdness, those, that port dip and on bump um, around six seven hundred hertz, right? the on axis everything is pretty smooth and it correlates very well so you can eq the speaker down to have a very flat response and everything will sound good you know that that's basically the um the reason why i'm including this mm. um and here's the in-room response so you, you'll notice that there was a big high q kind of bump um in, in the far field at around one kilohertz well look at this in-room response 
it, it manifests as a big rise in, in uh, output from like 600 hertz to like almost two kilohertz, right? Mm -hmm. it, it manifests in the room. And then that's what, if you're using these to mix, this is how you're going to be mixing, right? You won't, you won't hear this if you're trying to make your mix sounds natural. You're not going to hear this. But if you made your mix sound natural on these speakers and then listen to it on like a, a neutral system on a good loud, on another person's good loudspeaker system or some good headphones or whatever, right? It's not recessed. That's going to sound recessed. And, that, and that's a very critical range because that's where so yeah. much of our speech is. That's, that, that's a really critical range, right? So like, That'll that'll mess up your mix if you're if you're if it's like a super serious mix, right? So like, the speakers these these aren't suitable speakers for professional applications. That that's yeah, and I can't imagine many studios would be using two hundred and sixty dollar pair of mono price speakers. In there yeah, anyway. so this is not a big deal. But even if you're if you're like a, a in the so called prosumer class, like you're just making like music for maybe a small label or something yourself, yeah. or you're doing some kind of like streaming, right? It it, it could still be a problem. It could still be a problem, but like maybe in that capacity, not as big of a deal because you don't have, there's not a lot of money writing on the content you're producing. Okay. Now here's, I, I actually bought, I was curious about these speakers based on some of the marketing and some word of mouth. So oh, these speakers sound pretty good. Right. So I actually bought these, right. Never, we didn't review them or anything, but um, these are the Behringer next K8. So that's the title says, um, mm -hmm. all, all, all these speakers are the same class. I just say they're all like powered monitors with like, you know, eight inch woofers and one inch tweeters basically. So they're all in the same kind of size and like yeah. class of monitor. And like um, these uh, had a problem, right? I bought these and I kind of regretted it. <laughs> so if you go to the next slide, you'll see what I mean. Oof. Yeah, okay. So for those who aren't like acquainted with like loudspeaker performance graphs, you want that those lines to be generally flat, right? You want them to be flat, right? Especially for monitors. For home audio speakers, there's some deviations from flat you can have, but not not for monitors. You you want these to be flat because that means that they're totally neutral. These are not totally neutral. There's all kinds of problems, all kinds of problems everywhere in, in every single curve. There, the directivity indexes, the on axis, the listening window, the uh, early reflections. There's a lot of problems with the speaker. Like so, if you try to make a mix, like whatever music or anything, right? there's no way to predict what the sound is going to be like, like, like on any other speaker system, because the problems of the speaker is so complex. So like, yeah, you, you don't want Maybe to Maybe they're it. trying to compete with the Yamaha NS tens from, from, you know, decades ago, which were also a bad measuring monitor that people. Yeah. Use Maybe this is like an homage to like that. Yeah. Like, like a follow up. Hey, let's try to rekindle that. that recapture that old magic. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. So here's the near fields, right? That the previous graph we saw was the far fields. Lots of problems. Yeah. Here's the near fields. Actually, that the the light blue trace is a the far field, and I'm I put that there to compare it with the near fields. I didn't. I omitted the near field of the port. Yeah. There was problems there, but you know it got too crazy with all those lines, so I decided not. To, you know, I mean, and it looks like you're using active crossovers because that woofer roll off is steep, but it also looks like it's ringing. You know. About yeah. There's what is that four kilohertz? I see like some type of ringing or something going on. Yeah, this speaker. A breakup okay. mode or something. It's a breakup mode. It might be a, a, a problem with the crossover. Um, yeah, this, all these speakers use active crossovers. This And this would have a DSP crossover. So this digital signal processing going on, which gives you a lot of flexibility and power and how to arrange these crossovers. I don't know what wrong here. But There's anyways, also a lot of overlap within that two to three kilohertz range between the woofer and the tweeter, which could be causing some of that peaking too. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of the peaks and dips, as we'll see. Um, so a big problem with this, if you look at the near fields, as you uh, pointed out, Gene, that the the woofer band is intruding quite a bit into the tweeter's band. But the, the okay, the tweeter's band is recording some of the woofer's output, like but above, like say one point five kilohertz, it's all the tweeter. The woofer is not getting in there. But yeah. The problem is, look look how far the woofer extends into the tweeter's band. You don't want these things to overlap, or if you want them yeah. to overlap, like a, a smooth crossover where like the, they're like they're sloping into each other, but this they're just they're just overlapping each other. Right? We saw that with all the other ones; they had a nice gentle slope, you know, between the two drivers. This one does not. So this, this is this is a clear design issue. I think so. Or it might be a manufacturing issue. Yeah. It might be that maybe some value got like messed up in the manufacturing and, and the, but e even so, 
QC should have caught this, right? The quality control should have caught this. So like, whether it, if it, even if it's a manufacturing problem, it's still a problem because um, for the consumer, because now we, you have a brand that either there's a serious design issue or there's a manufacturing issue because the quality control isn't there to catch this. And you have what is not a great loudspeaker, you know, pretty bad for a, a monitor that is supposed to be, you know, used to create content, right? You now let's can't. be clear now you measured the left and the right speaker and got the similar results right it wasn't just one speaker that was a goof you measured both of them both of them measured the same and i, I have them here uh, this this one is right here this is the behringer by the way that's over my um yeah. left shoulder the, the Let me show people yeah the presonus is right here um and th these are really good like like i said i bought these after reviewed them i bought these to review them and that was a yeah. problem i never now did, you're right? stuck with them I'm stuck with them, right? So like they're and so these are like compare and contrast, right? They're they're yeah. One's really good, other not so good. Um, yeah, and uh, so this is a problem, and 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 it's clear from these near fields what's causing all the problems on the on axis. I mean the far field response because you're going to have serious phase conflicts with the woofer and tweeter when they overlap so much. And that's yeah. what we're going to see in, in subsequent graphs. And that's such a bad region to put a resonance at two kilohertz. Our ears are so sensitive; we'll pick that up easily. Yeah, that's not. It, it's a problem. So, but but I'm um, going on to the next slide. So here's the vertical axis to uh, kind of compare with that one we saw with the SV28, where it was fine. It it summed well, at least on the tweeter axis, which is what you'd want for any basically any loudspeaker. This doesn't sum well on the tweeter's axis, right? There's a huge bump there. But if you go above and beyond, there's a huge null. And then there's a bump again. And then there's nulls again, right? Very inconsistent sound. It, it Because the, the, the woofer and the tweet are just fighting because they share too much bandwidth, right? They're fighting each other. So there's nowhere on the vertical axis where you can put these that they're going to sound like, you know, normal, basically. Oh, accurate. Exactly. The yeah. next slide actually shows this too from like a, a bird's eye perspective of, this, of the same data. This uses color to um, um, bring out the uh, amplitude. And so we're so drawing a, a, a straight horizontal line through here where there's just gonna be nothing but red, right? Or just a solid color or a, a uniform color. Where would you put that line here, right? That's gonna be too hot in some areas or too cold mm -hmm. in others, but there's no consistent place to put like, like a, a, a straight line through uh, any horizontal no, yeah. point on this. Right? You, you know what I'm concerned about now is that you just measured one Behringer model. How do we know the whole lineup of their monitors doesn't have similar issues, or is it just a fluke that they have one lemon and the rest are good speakers? You know, we I don't think, know. I I don't know if this is a fluke. I but I know Behringer doesn't make. I also have some old speakers. They're called the Behringer Truth Twenty Thirty One P's. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty darn good. They're an older, much older speaker. They're passive, and those are actually really good. And that's why Could I was a different designer too. Yeah, totally different. Actually, it was kind of a they just copied a a Genelec design, right? Behringer back then was known for kind of copying other designs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they just took a, the Genelec design and kind of made it their own. And it was a really, really good, cheap loudspeaker. And that's why I was interested in these speakers. Like, well, maybe they developed that loudspeaker to be even better. No. This is way worse than the, the truth. Maybe we should give these away in a contest. <laughs> We'd be punishing the people entering. We'd be without, punishing the winner. <laughs> we want, we want, yeah, we want people to enter these contests, right? Not like stay away from them, right? We're yeah. trying to promote things. Okay. So here's here's the horizontal axis. Um, wow, that's really messed up. Yeah, bad. That's bad. And like, it's bad. I don't know what else to say. You can see this is supposed to be smooth lines. This might be one of the worst measuring speakers you've ever measured for audioholics it might be right up there I mean, well i didn't measure this for audioholics i just measured this out of like idle yeah. curiosity but yeah i measured this um and yeah this is bad <laughs> this is just not good so if you try to mix with the, these speakers if you try to use these as their intended application as a studio mm -hmm. monitor what you would end up creating would be it, it couldn't be good it couldn't be right if it sounded good with these speakers it won't sound good with any other speakers unless they were equally abysmal and that's the importance of this live stream is what James is trying to say. You need, if you're mixing, if you're producing a record, you need to have a speaker that's neutral because if you don't and you mix it for a speaker that's colored, it's going to make a good speaker in your home. If you have a neutral speaker in your home sound, not great. So it's really important more than ever. If you're 
designing a studio monitor to have a much more neutral response and then have these warts. Yeah. These design warts, these design warts might, some of them might be forgivable in a home environment for an audiophile kind of speaker, but they're unforgivable when you're, when you're producing and mixing the music. It, it, it's, ba it's basically a broken tool. It's a tool that can't do what it's you know, supposed to do. So like monitors are tools. They're not some kind of like, you know, you can use them as like recreational enjoyment for recreational enjoyment. And some of them do sound very good in that capacity, but they're really meant for an application to like, you know, just to hear what you're trying to produce like accurately. This mm -hmm. can't do that. This is a, it's a broken tool. And so on, you know, and, and going to the next slide, I think I have the same thing. Okay. So now here's where the on axis um, response is zeroed out like stereo file does, right? Yep. Same kind of measurement. And so um, with this, you can see how inconsistent the off axis responses are to the on axis response. That means there's no way to EQ this, right? As with the uh, the vertical response, there's no correlation from the off axis response to the on axis response. And so like, it, it's gonna sound different at whatever angle you're listening to. There's not gonna be a tonal like um, consistency anywhere around the speaker, anywhere around it. So like, it's a problem. And that's the, that's what this um, graph shows. Okay, now, so we got these reference speakers. Um, they're pretty darn cool. I like these things. We, we, I didn't have a reference speaker, so we, we uh, called around to see who, who would be up for making us, uh, um, yep. so, so for making me uh, like uh, a speaker that I could use to compare with others. You need a control speaker, James. You need a speaker that you know is not only designed neutral, but just sounds good. It's built well. It's consistent. It has decent power handling, good sensitivity. We needed you to have a reference speaker. Yeah. So that's why we got Philharmonic, right? It's a Philharmonic. Well, uh, these are actually built by Salk Sound. Um, we we asked like Dennis Murphy if there's something yeah. he could like do for us in terms of a reference speaker. And I kind of wanted a simple reference speaker to serve as a basis as comparison with other speakers that I reviewed, right? Yep. And like, so there were there were some speakers that they were called the Ellis eighteen o one speakers, and he kind of made us um, a customized version of the eighteen o ones. We call them the eighteen o two Gs. They're uh, similar. They use like a different cabinet. They kind of have a different uh, a tuning point. They, these are using, uh, as opposed to the eighteen o ones, these are using uh, the uh, SES uh, graphene drivers. So this is kind of a a pretty sophisticated driver. These are very, very good drivers. This is a very high fidelity speaker. This is a one of a kind. You can't buy this. One of a kind comes to custom speaker made for us by Dennis Murphy. He had to redo the crossover circuit. It took a lot of time. <laughs> and I like, and it was, a, it was, a, it was a big favor, but he came through with their awesome speakers. Um, and uh, so we, you know, big nod of thanks to Dennis Murphy. These, these are great speakers. And um, yep. so, and, and these are very neutral. So like we were saying, you could use monitors for recreational listening and they're fine if they're, you know, and, but some, some home audio speakers you could actually use for monitors if they're neutral enough. And this is very neutral. So that's a pretty flat, you know, response. And um, it's important to note, this is a passive speaker with passive crossovers and it's measuring better than, than most of those active monitors. Yeah. And, and most of them have like DSP, you know, digital. Yeah. That's a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so like, it's, it's really good that, this has a response that, that it does. Um, you can see like a, a blip. I mean, the response, like the uh, listening window and on axis response adhere very tightly to say that 82 dB tick on the um, Y axis, right? Mm -hmm. except, except for that blip around like say 800 Hertz, right? That was a porous port resonance in the first um, iteration of these. And we, we took, that's been fixed. They, there was a new port we installed. So the second iteration, this is just flat from from beginning to end, just flat. The po that that port resonance isn't there. This is how I measure. It. I'm gonna I'm gonna remeasure these. And uh, well, I actually already have measured them, but I haven't done like the the far field anechoic measurements, right? Yeah. But basically, these are just dead flat from top to bottom, but with both listening window and on axis response, just flat, it's right? This is beautiful measurement. Extremely yeah. neutral speakers, right? And so, go and and I use this as a basis to compare how how audible is are those problems with the Behringer Next monitor, right? So I use this as like a, a basis for comparison since this is extremely neutral and those aren't, well, how do those manifest in, in, in audible problems, right? So here's, yeah. the, here's the in-room response of the LS1801G custom reference speakers, right? Left versus right at the main listening position averaged. Five, five point average, uh, position averages of both speakers. 
I'm like, that's a really, really, really good response. Like, you know, it's a beautiful house curve, right? Just like, they're good speakers, and this is what good speakers do. Um, and then the next slide shows you what the um, Behringer's do, right? Wow. Same, measured, you know, same position, same measurements, right? Look at the high frequencies just kind of die on the Behringer's too. Yeah, well, I should say readers, our viewers, ignore the levels that these were measured at, right? We're yeah. looking at the shape. We're, we're interested in the shape. Look at the shape, time, yeah. Not the levels, okay? And so, <laughs> like, it, it's it's... It's a problem, right? Those so those those um, 1802 Gs they weren't meant for like critical listening applications. You could use them as studio monitors; they were beautifully for that application. They were not meant for this. On the other hand, these um, these Behringer studio monitors were meant for accurate sound reproduction. They don't do that at all, not at all. If you try to mix something, if you try to make uh, a, a sound mix with this, it just it, it it wouldn't sound good. Or if it did sound good, it would sound bad in every other sound system. So I'm wondering if there's any mixing engineers that are watching this uh, video, if you have experience with the speaker in a studio setting, give us a comment down below. I'd love to hear if you had them and you pulled them out for this very reason. I think most studios are probably using higher end monitors. This is yeah. meant for the prosumer crowd, like bedroom studios, right? Yeah. They, but like bedroom studios, they want, like, like we saw with the PreSonus and Kali monitors, they don't have to be, you know, that those are the, kind of the same price range as these. And those don't, those are really good. And they don't have those problems. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I compared the, how these sound, right? The graphs are one thing. Measurements are one thing, but audible performance is another thing. So, you know, I gave the both speakers the best possible placement in the settings. There's a lot of settings in the back of the Behringer's that can adjust how they sound. So I, I tried to get them where they sound the most neutral. Um, I used like, I used Cobas to do comparisons. So like we had really good quality music, um, high, high, you know, sampling rate, high quality streaming. And um, um, if you go back to the slide, um, I, I need I need my talking points. I done blast without them, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. The, okay. The, I, this is a slide comparison done. Okay. I have to. The caveat here is that um, I know how these, I I kind of know the flaws of these speakers when I was setting this up. So like, this isn't a very precise or like take take this whole comparison with a, a, the grain of salt because this is a, a cited comparison by someone done by someone who knows how these speakers perform, right? Objectively, right? So yeah. like I can't do an unobjective. This is not an unobjective. This is a very subjective comparison. Not a double blind controlled test. So take yeah. this for what it's worth, and it not maybe not be worth very much, you know. But I, I I but I compared these. I know how they sound, and like well how how do they how does that manifest into audible listening experience? And so the next slide shows what I, how I thought they compared. So like compared to the eighteen oh two Gs the. The KAs had like a cupped sound, right? Like when you put your like you know hands over your mouth, right? It's almost mm -hmm. like a horn sound, right? Although this, the waveguide is pretty like you know, um, uh, uh, it's not very uh, aggressive at all. Also, there like like you'd expect, there was it was a very sibilant speaker, especially on like the sh and ch consonant sounds of words, right? W when anybody said those words like in a vulgar or something, those those consonants really popped, right, on the Behringers. Also. They had a narrow sound stage. They didn't. They weren't as like very expansive. And that's not necessarily a problem, right? But they they kind of had a wider placement than the eighteen oh two G. So that it's weird that they'd have a narrower sound stage. They didn't have they didn't have the breadth of the eighteen oh Gs. But the eighteen oh two Gs would be a, a wider dispersion loudspeaker. So yeah. there's that. Also, snares and claps and and percussion was overemphasized on the makes sense with that two kilohertz bump. Yeah, so like those really popped. Those really, I mean, just you know, you hear them like you can't ignore them, right? Mm -hmm. And over overall, less clarity. There was that. It wasn't the airiness, kind of the expansiveness. Um, they just didn't sound as clear, right? And that's what you expect when there's a, a big phase conflict between the woofer and the tweeter, right? So that that was my experience on A B, like comparing them one after another. Like I I qu switch quickly switched between them. And like to to get a good sense of how they sound compared to each other, and like, and and, and here's here's another point I want to make. Okay, for all their problems, the next K eights, you could listen to them and still enjoy music. They're a flawed speaker, but they weren't, they weren't unlistenably bad. I'm gonna say so. Mm -hmm. So they yeah, weren't gas station PA system bad. No, they weren't that. They're, they're, I would <laughs> still take those over any almost any sound bar. Uh, they're, they're, so they had their flaws, but. You could enjoy music with them. They're just nowhere near good enough for the application. Won't mix on them. 
yeah, you can't create content with these and expect the sound, content to sound good. And so to sum it up, um, studio monitors are tools, like we said, but like any type of tool, there's a wide range of quality that can be had. And it, it's a risk to buy blind, as I found out, especially if you intend to produce serious or commercial content. Thankfully, I wasn't, right? I was just com uh, kind of curious about their performance. So measurements here are critical indicators for tonal balance. It's like our, our human hearing can miss a lot at an initial listening session that you know measurements might pick up. Um, so like, yeah, you can listen to some monitors uh, or, or any speaker and they'll sound fine at first, right? Or you may just not notice the, the problems they have because you might not mind be sampling the right range of music or, or th there could be a ton of things going on. Um, but for, for monitors, measurements, you need measurements to make sure that those speakers are actually good. You need like third party measurements, basically like what we do or some other places, you know, you, you need, you need, I would say a third party um, verification of the speaker's accuracy. I would, I wouldn't buy a monitor without that. Right. So, like, well, I mean, it was a good lesson for you to learn. Unfortunately, it costs you money out of pocket, but Hey, if there are any audio sadists that want yeah. a bad sounding speaker that can pierce your ears a little bit, reach out. James might be able to sell them to you. I'll sell them. Oh yeah. I'll sell these to you. Yeah. If you want, if you like, yeah. At a good price. Right. <laughs> sure. Right. I mean, I'm not, I don't expect to recoup my money from those, but like it was a, it was a not, somewhat, somewhat costly lesson. They were like only $400. So it's not, not a huge, hugely costly lesson, but like, yeah, they're not, it, it, it was worth it for all the strangeness this, like th that is a learning experience. It was worth it for that. Like, yeah. I, I didn't expect that. And, and it was interesting to learn how, how these speakers were like the problems um, kind of like became, came to be like, I don't know. Well, hopefully, Bar maybe Behringer will reach out to us and say, hey, James, we have a new version of that speaker we want to send you and swap it out. And we could do a follow up and say, hey, this is the new and improved version. And here's what we found. I don't think that's going to happen, but we'll see. I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic, man. Yeah, uh, we'll see. I, I had hard trouble getting, I couldn't get a hold of Behringer. I didn't yeah, I don't have any contacts. Yeah, well, they're owned by Music Tribe, and I don't know, like, I couldn't get a hold of anybody over there. So, like, I bought these and like, uh, oh well. <laughs> well, look, guys, we're not trying to bash Behringer. We're just trying to show as an example, and they might as what well, they might have some really good speakers in their lineup that don't measure like this. We just don't know because we haven't checked it out. But it is important, you know. The measurements are important. It's good to have subjective listening tests, of course, in a review, but it's also good to have measurements. And when you could correlate the two, that's when it's really useful information, especially if you're trying to find a neutral speaker for doing critical listening or mixing. Yeah. You, you, you need, like, if you want, if you're a content producer and you want your content to sound good, you need an accurate loud uh, sound system. It, there could be headphones. It could be speakers. And also the problems could be outside of the speakers or headphones. It could be somewhere else in your signal chain, right? Yeah. It could be software issue. So like you have to be sure, that whatever you're mixing is is being reproduced accurately, or, or you have no idea how it's going to sound on any any other sound system. So it's good uh, to have like uh, third party verification that everything works correctly. Well, James, I appreciate all the work that you put into this slide presentation and the research and the listening tests and the measurements. This is quite a big effort. So, guys, please hit that thumb up, smash the subscribe button. If you like this video. You know, um, also don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. James, thanks again, man. I just appreciate all your efforts. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm glad to be here. All right, guys. Well, that's a wrap. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.